time is 48 minutes past 10 and you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with the very noisy uh, Steve Bastoni. <laughs> you can hear he actually has arrived in the studio Hello. smashing his phone through oh the no. I'm through so the mics. sorry. I'm so sorry I'll be late. <laughs> Never trust Siri. No, no, mm. or... There are some other tips I could give you is to put the correct address in. That would help, yeah, yeah. Well. Distinguish between South Melbourne and Box Hill. That's probably a good starter, yes. yeah. But a very, very big welcome. I did have a bit of a fanfare, a bit of red carpet laid out <laughs> for you, Steve. You are, um, you know, probably one of my most famous guests um, oh. that I've had in the studio, now famous for being the latest <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry that the higher place came and took away the red carpet <laughs> because your time was up. It doesn't uh, last long here no. at 3WBC, but it really is a thrill to have you uh, here. Uh, and uh, Pleasure. Uh, most people I interview on my show I know already, and we've only become friends in the last week, really, or even, yeah. even less than a week, yeah. uh, but have spent already a significant amount of time on the telephone um, chatting about all the all the challenging things about life and yep. Um, yep. Yep. learning from each other. We're both a bit of a um, adv advocates for, for men's health and, yep. and mental health, but most people will know you for uh, some of your starring roles in uh, Police Rescue, and neighbours, but also uh, blockbuster movies as mm. well. Uh, Water Divider and the Matrix, Matrix yeah. Reloaded, all those ones that I've never seen. A lot of people know me from um, Underbelly and Wentworth as well. Oh, yes. They're the shows that I get sort of the most, you know, like in the supermarket. Oh, they're, they're, you're Louis Bayer. <laughs> Is that out of... Uh, Underbelly, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, so. Well, I was in Wentworth last year, Were actually. You? Yes, I yeah. was in that. Um, it's a great show. I think in the final... In the final show, I think, awesome. and I was a stenographer in the courtroom with uh, the freak. Oh, and Pamela bit, Rabe. Yeah, it was great. But She's in, amazing. <laughs> she, in fact, I saw her on an episode of A Country Practice the other day because I'm watching that. Yeah. And uh, she's a lot younger, but yeah. still has that same presence, presence about yeah, her. Yeah, she's very mm. really amazing. But I was um, the stenographer, and me being a people connector, um, you know, you do scenes a, a number of times. And they said, oh, Ray, you're pretty good at this. Why don't you take um, Pamela some water during the scene? You can have a bit of a walking bit. So I'm doing that. And I'm doing, I've, wa I've kept on walking up to time and time. And then I'm going, oh, there you go. And, I'm, and I seduce her into going, oh, thank you very much. They go, the freak can't be saying thank you very much <laughs> in the courtroom. But anyway, this is not about me and my stardom. This is about you. So, um, again, welcome. Thanks. Uh, how I... Uh, fell across you, not literally, but um, thought oh, you'd be a great guest on the show, is, you know, quite recently you've been speaking a lot in the media about um, some of your challenges during your career trajectory and uh, how you've overcome those challenges and uh, really, you know, wanting to speak publicly in a way that will inspire others or give people better ideas around uh, how to overcome and uh, come back. Because you're also um, an ambassador for... Lifeline. Yeah, and are you okay, Day? Yeah. 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 Look, I'll I'll start by uh, this little disclaimer. I'm I'm in no way, shape, or form an expert in men's health or addiction or any of the other issues that I've sort of worked with or through in my life. And, and I'm just at the point where I'm, you know, obviously I don't think I've got this thing whipped. I don't think I know the answers. All I know is that I, I've had challenges in my life which I've uh, had the opportunity to either run from or face and because uh, I found through experience that you can never run far enough <laughs> that you get away from this stuff uh, so you eventually do have to turn around and face whatever it is that's troubling you and uh, like I said I'm no expert in that any of those fields but I do know that um, just through acknowledging that there's problems and uh, being willing to face them um, and, you know, going on this sort of journey of trying to become a better person and, and address the things that have been causing me problems in the past, um, just by doing that, just by virtue of doing that and being willing to try and seek help and connect with other people who might be going through or might have been through similar things and have found better ways to live, just by doing that, I feel um, obliged to share my, you know, journey for other people who might be out there in, you know, struggling as well and trying to find a way to become a better person or, you know, um, get through trauma or addiction or 
loneliness or uh, any of those things, gambling, you know, whatever it is that that men um, generally, I'm, I'm speaking with men because uh, about men because that's been my journey and the people who I've connected with who've helped me along with my um, recovery have been men. Yeah, and a lot of women too, but it's just that I find that working closely and you know the work that's required to get through that kind of stuff is really personal and very. Um, you got to make yourself vulnerable and you got to open yourself up and being willing to talk about things that are uncomfortable, and um, because you know they're the things, they're those little secrets that that are going to keep us sick. You know, so they're the things that I've sort of uh, realized that I've got to discuss and, and, and unpack and, and look at and share with another person um, who may have had a similar experience who can help me find a way to deal with that stuff. So, so, so you found it typically easier to work with men? Yeah, I did because a lot of the stuff that we talk about um, is, like I said, it's very vulnerable, it's very personal, it's not stuff that generally you'd be comfortable sharing with a woman. Um, you know, although my wife, you know, I'm very honest with her. She, she might say bullshit, but, <laughs> you know, we, we have a great relationship. We talk about stuff. We get down in the trenches and, you know, and um, and that's been a key, you know, and we've had our challenges in our relationship and, and that's been a key to sort of work moving forward with that stuff as well. And But generally speaking, I find that it's easier to work with, um, for me, to work with men because once you... You know, there is always the danger too that when you work on such an intimate level where you're sort of opening up parts of yourself which, are, you know, they're squirmy bits that you really feel uncomfortable about t discussing. Um, when you, If you share that with a woman, you, you get very intimate and, and that could be, you know, that can maybe a sexual development or attraction can sort of, you know, if you become, you know... Uh, you form a, such a strong bond that if there's a sexual chemistry there, it can really convolute it and complement uh, and and. Um, did you say complement? Compli complicate. <laughs> I meant to say. I heard Com compliment. Yeah, yeah. I did say that, but that wasn't. But a it's interesting um, hearing this coming out of your mouth, giving that you know I'm I'm an expert in men's health, yeah. and you know that's you know I'm also work with a lot of men one yeah. on one and yeah. find it um, what you're saying resonates with me in that you know a lot of the work that we do especially in the advocacy space is around creating male friendly services and there aren't that many so you know your feeling of not wanting to go into female centric um, spaces for therapy is very very uncomfortable well having said that I mean I, I wouldn't mind going like I see a female therapist um, I, I talk to a female therapist and I open up about that stuff because she's a professional. I feel that there's a different, there's a divide. I'm talking about peer-to-peer -peer help. Right. Okay. You know, when I talk peer-to-peer, -peer, like people who experience similar experiences yep. in me, there then there's a, it can be, the line can get murky. But if I'm dealing with a mental health professional, yes. like a counsellor, a, a, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, somebody who I've gone to for professional help, I feel that there's already an established line that we don't cross yep. because it's a professional you know, yeah, uh, no, that makes that makes sense. I yeah. just I just wanted to clarify that sure. a little bit for yeah, our yeah. listeners, just in case they go, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't I don't think that only women, only men can help us. You know, I think that it's important to actually sometimes get a female perspective on things because, um, I don't know. I mean, even gender, just saying that makes me squirm because I don't think that it's like female or male perspective. I think generally that we share a lot more in common than we have, you know, differences, yes. men and women, and I think that. You know, part of the, the the whole confusing thing that men seem to be going through at the moment, well, you know, is is this um, you know this perception that you know men and women are like oil and water or can't get along or you know will never understand each other. And I mean, all this bullshit that we've been told. I think we need to sort of start going. Well, is that true? I mean, why is that true? And and why can't we? Sure, we're different, but um, we've like, always been different. We've always been different, yeah. And but I, I mean, I just I think that. Um, that often has come at a cost, at such a cost, because we've sort of accepted that as the, the, the sort of predominant narrative that says, oh, men and women don't understand each other, so don't even try. Mm. You know, and, and in just not trying, we've become <laughs> completely, you know. Well, there's so much confusing and conflicting literature and language yeah. out there at the moment yeah. about, uh, you know, gender yeah like, you know, yeah just, just the yeah. word gender. the word gender makes me want to and then yeah, yeah and then you <laughs> add that up to the mental health um phrasing yeah. Yeah. which means you know we we we, uh, we assume that mental health means illness and yeah physical health mean means healthy mm. and 
So I think that, you know, if we can just start sort of just getting away from the confusion of it yeah and back to you know just simplifying things and um which i'm going to do next because i just want to drag ourselves all the way back to um to your origins now you were born in rome yes and came here to australia when you were wee tacker i was eight yeah eight and uh, your dad didn't come with you no my parents separated and dad stayed in rome and mum came out here with three kids in the 72 and he's an Olympic kayaker. He was, yeah, yeah. he was. Uh, he passed away in 93, but he represented Italy in the 52 Helsinki Olympics. Yeah. There you go. Mm. So what was it like growing up without your dad? Uh, well, it was, pro- it, was, it was tough because, you know, like young boys need, they need a f- sort of male figure, I reckon, um, need a strong leader. And I mean, my mum was pretty tough and she was uh, a strong woman. But there's just, I think, a balance that boys need. And um, you know, I, I certainly missed that and f- sort of found father figures in my sister's boyfriends at the time who were older boys. And so they were my male role models, um, hence why I, I kind of lost my way because <laughs> a lot of them weren't exactly upstanding, fine, upstanding citizens. You know, quite, uh, you know, they were, you know, they were guys, uh, you know, generally who who lost, you know, who all lost their way as well. So, you know, they were tough guys, um, you know, often involved in crime and drugs, and um, um, they were the guys who sort of I looked up to because they were all that was around, really. Yep. Yeah. So, what then inspired you into um, treading the boards? Well, my mum was involved in amateur theatre at the Melbourne University Italian Theatre Group. And so I, um, I got dragged in. <laughs> well, they were looking for a kid to pl- do a monologue in Venetian dialect as part of this play called Minestrone, which was going to the Adelaide Fringe Festival. And obviously, you know, there's not a lot of eight-year-old Italian-speaking actors in Australia, or there wasn't in those days. So mum said, do you want to do it? And I said, oh, yeah, sure, it sounds fun. So I went and did this monologue. Um, and, and I just remember that this packed auditorium was about 1,500 people in this theatre in Adelaide and I don't even remember if I got my lines right but I do remember just they loved they loved the fact that a kid was getting up and speaking Italian and they just went crazy and I just thought wow this is good mm. I like this I want more of this and of course you know my career has been a futile attempt to recapture that glorious applause ever since <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yeah. like the first time. Yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, you know, like a little kid, an eight year old kid can get on stage and pick his nose, and the audience will think it's amazing. Yeah, you know? yeah. especially if he's speaking a foreign language. Yeah, exactly. About soup. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So then, did that continue? No, it didn't. I, I mean, I just sort of let it fizzle. Uh, I never really pursued. It was just a one-off sort of thing. And then, when I was sixteen, um, a couple of producers came to my school to cast a short film about skip what was called skipping class and it was about uh, the migrant um, parent teacher student triangle and how difficult it was for some young kids of a migrant background to uh, uphold their cultural uh, tradition and identity at home and then be this Aussie at school and and what it did to them you know how it fractured their Mm. personality in a way they had to be these double agents you know which is obviously really confusing for a kid yeah. Um, and so that's uh, <laughs> it was kind of something that I could identify with, you know, and um, because coming from Italy, coming here and uh, not having a dad and all that sort of stuff was, you know, it was a tough time coming to a new school and being treated, you know, a little bit differently and being not quite knowing where you fit in. So that was um, at the premiere screening of that. I got an agent and um, Lorraine West of the Actors Agency, the great late great. Lorraine West, who was uh, amazing in in the industry, um, and started many people's careers. She asked if I wanted representation, and and took me on, and I just started working from there. What a great experience! Mm. Yeah, it was it was amazing. And so this at this age of sixteen, mm. was this when you were um, you had your, your your role models in life as well? Earlier than that, yeah. Oh. I mean, when I was about eleven. Um, you know, when I was about 11, I started seeing these, these tough guys with tattoos and smoking things they shouldn't be doing and, you know, riding motorbikes and all that kind of stuff coming through my house. And so I was like, okay, that's what, 
you know, that's the dude that I've got to become. Because yeah. we grew up in Carlton in the 70s. It was like a real hippie. Most people assume um, because I've got an Italian surname that I grew up in some kind of strict Italian household. And that's yeah. not just completely is, not. Is that why you got the role in Underbelly? Because of your experience in growing up in Carlton? Well, no, <laughs> that, that would have been because of my experience <laughs> living in King's Cross. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I was no stranger to that world. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, you know, you sort of, as, as a kid, you're very influenced by your environment and that was my environment. So, you know, I was working in a nightclub when I was 16 and, you know, I was working at Inflation in Melbourne's nightclub wow. at Inflation when I was 16. And um, and so I just started, you know, partying and living this kind of crazy life from that age really and earlier really because, you know, when I was 12, 13, like, um, you know, I was already sort of getting up to no good. <laughs> yeah. So how did you manage, like, you know, you've got Lorraine West on one side, which sounds like Mary Poppins. Yeah. And then on the other side, you've got this other life. Was that just effortless to manage because that was all you knew? Yeah, it was second nature. Like I knew that um, I had to sort of, uh, look, I became pretty good pretty early at putting on the mask and, and, you know, reading a situation and what I need to be in this situation and what I need to be in that situation. And, you know, like um, when I hang around these people, I'm this guy. And when I hang around those people, I'm that guy. And I had a multitude of sort of uh, personalities, I guess, or, or masks, I'd like to call them masks, that I used to use to get me through, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was um, uh, probably... You know, it was it was difficult to sort of, um, you know, eventually sort of go. Well, who am I? You yes. know, who's the real Steve? You know, did so that, that help you in terms of developing characters as well? Not at all. No, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, look, I was always an observer of people, so I think that kind of helps to have that curiosity about why people do things that they do. So I think that helped. And I was a natural kind of performer. I was a bit of a show off at school and all this kind of stuff, mainly out of insecurity, really. I mean, most, you know, people think that show offs are extremely confident. And, yep. and that's just not the truth. You know, show offs and most actors I know are incredibly shy people mm. who, who put on the mask of, of overconfidence and um, big, you know, ego in order to, well, you need a reasonable size ego to survive being an actor because yes. of all the rejection involved. But, um, you know, most people who, who have those big personalities are actually hiding the fact that they, they're they quite uh, shy and insecure. Can I just step back in, in relation to this, to Skipping Class, mm. um, your first, um, it was a documentary or film? Or it was a short film. A short yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, is that still available? don't know. Probably somewhere. I've got a VHS copy of it. Right. <laughs> it was a 42-minute short film commissioned by the Canberra Schools Commission. Um, to address at that stage, um, you know, multiculturalism was a yeah. big word yes. and people were looking at how, you know, uh, second generation migrants were coming through the school system and um, and how that was all sort of playing mm. out. And, you know, that that kids were torn, you know. Yeah, having... I, just, I just think it's an amazing subject. And I just had mm. a text message from somebody asking where they could get a copy of it because right. it, it still is, um, is an issue. Somebody's trying to ring the studios here. But, okay. um, Do you want me to answer? I don't think it could be anyone though. I mean, we could e we could easily give it a go and take it straight to air. Okay. Say hello, Steve Bastoni. Hello, Steve Bastoni speaking. We are broadcasting at the moment, sir. You can't pick us up on any of the channels. Well, Ray uh, might be able to help you here. Yes, um, if you can just let the caller know that yeah. unfortunately uh, United Energy uh -huh. is doing some maintenance at the moment. So okay. um, anyone can stream live. If they go to our website. If you go to the website, you can stream it live from the website. You don't have a computer? Oh, maybe a smartphone? You, no. Because uh, unfortunately, United Energy is doing some work, so they can't actually get it happening. There we go. This is real I'm, live I'm actually radio. live on air, so I have we to go, have... mate. But just check out the website. Get someone's smartphone and jump on the website. Yeah, yeah. Try on a smartphone. And get on the website. See, there you go. Um, I've got to. I've got to go. I'm alive on air. Bye. <laughs> That's um. Thank you for doing that because <laughs> that just showed me um that not only are you an Academy Award nominated um, um actor, but also you can you're good at customer service. So <laughs> if, 
if it all goes down the drain. <laughs> um, yeah. But unfortunately, yes, uh, for the station today, uh, things haven't worked out for me as expected, but I'm certainly, um, my resilience brings in that whatever's happening is the thing that's happening and yeah. what can we work with what we've got. Yeah. I happen to find a lot of seven-minute songs um, wow. that I <laughs> used to fill in the time. Uh, but um, going back to that uh, movie, uh, Skipping yeah. Class, yeah, somebody had just uh, texted me to say that uh, they were interested in getting copy because mm. it is still very relevant at the moment, even though we have come such a long way in terms of what we call diversity and inclusion, which probably makes you throw up a bit <laughs> in your own face as well. Um, it, it still exists. Yeah, absolutely. You know, discrimination still exists. And absolutely. these children that are coming into schools are actually being discriminated against. So Yeah, I mean, it's like we were the WOGs. Italians and Greeks were the WOGs. Then once we got established, the Lebos and the Chinese were the WOGs. And then once they got established, the Vietnamese and, the, you know, and the, and now the Africans, are, you know, yes, are the new. It's always so going to be somebody. It's, it's always like the people, the migrants who come yep. the latest are the, one, are the minority that sort of cops it. And yep. it's it's funny because, you know, all it takes is, is – and it, it always happens. Somebody from that minority group eventually just raises their head and go, no, yes. you know, I'm actually a worthy person and I can do things and I'm going to be valuable to your community, to our community, yeah. you know. And and so suddenly, you know, the perceptions change and, you know, hopefully yep. we all get along. <laughs> but I mean, it's part of your collection, you know. We, we are collecting kind of bits of Steve as we move through, uh, through the show. Uh, so now we've sort of got to the point where, you know, you've, you're you're established in a number of areas of life, some more healthy than others. Mm -hmm. At what stage of your career do you think you got to where you found it more difficult to manage? Um. Well, yeah. <clears throat> I didn't find I sort of didn't really manage. I just kind of survived. Well, that was the question, more difficult right, to manage. Right, mm. yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of just bluffed my way through and I always felt like a fraud. I always waited, was sort of waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder and go, mate, you don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> but I managed to fool most people <clears throat> and I've now realised that, you know, I do have a process and I am worthy of having a career and all of that stuff. But, you know, and it's a natural thing that people, everyone has this thing that they deep down feel they're not worthy of, of whatever it is that they're doing, uh, unless they've done a bit of work on themselves, in which case, and even then, they still have to remind themselves constantly that they are worthy and they have got a process and they are have got skills. But you've, um, I mean, you've been working with people like Russell Crowe, who it, it appears to be the most abundantly confident person in the universe, Robert Redford, the same, Kate Blanchett, mm, Glenn Close. Mm, uh, what was it like working with those people feeling perhaps the, the, a bit of the imposter syndrome? Well, I, you know, they're beautiful and generous and um, sensitive people, you know, all of them, you know, um, even, you know, people sort of look at Russell and see this kind of, you know, very confident, and he is confident. What do you reckon he would have done with the studio phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, he might have sang him a song. Um, but, you know, like everyone has a, you know, I think to any, anyone in the creative pursuit uh, will have self-doubt and they have that little voice that says, ah, you know, that questions our own ability and all of that stuff. And I think that's part of what makes people great is is the ability to go, you know, to because anybody who just goes through life thinking that they're 100% right all the time and that they're, they're just fine and dandy gen will have zero self-awareness, you know, like, so... Getting back to your original question, when it all got difficult for me was when the work stopped. <laughs> and, you know, the work stopped probably 15 years ago for a while. <clears throat> and I had to sort of go, well, okay, what's going on here? And also when um, my lifestyle, uh, when I, my son came along, my first son came along, my lifestyle wasn't conducive to having a family and wasn't conducive to sharing a life with somebody, anybody. Uh, I was, you know, very selfish. I'd, for 40 years, I'd sort of grown up um, just taking care of my own, myself, my own desires, my own wants and needs, and that was it. You know, there was no responsibility, zero responsibility. So when my kid came along, my first son, <clears throat> suddenly everything changed because there was this person in the world that I had, you know, responsibility for and had to look out for. And I had sort of, um, I suddenly became a grown-up. 
and I was totally unprepared for it because I was living like a spoiled child, you know, like, you know, like a rock star, really, um, mm. for 40 years. So, which was a lot of fun, yes, but not conducive to raising a family. No, <laughs> no, it's. I mean, I think that's it, that's the same for anyone who has their first child. It's it's a big adjustment, but um, quite often people have you know prepared or they've been living some kind of similar, yeah, um, responsible life until then. Yeah, it's funny. I you know me well enough now that I love research. And I was doing a little bit of research this morning and um, I, I knew that you and Melissa George had been quite friendly with each other at some stage of your life. Mm-hmm. Fabulous act, actor. Do we, call them, we call, do we call them actresses these days or actors? I don't know. I mean, it's a personal choice, really. I mean, it's like yeah. waiter, waitress. I don't think, I don't know. Personally, I don't find it diminutive or put down yeah. in any way. I just think it distinguishes uh, male from female, but. Well, what's, when your work sort of undried up a little bit, um, Bad Mothers was a production mm. that occurred back in 2019, yeah. I think. And um, that group unexpectedly um, did include um, an actual couple, which was you and Melissa George. Um, well, no, you weren't a couple in the show, mm. but you had been, um, you were cast in the same show. Yeah. And you had previously been yeah. dating back in the um, mid-90s or yeah. something. Yeah. Anyway, she says... Quote, can you imagine George says laughing? Ha <laughs> That's just me doing acting. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I thought. I thought I was the biggest floozy in Australia when I walked on that set. I said, oh, yeah, you've been living with Italian, this Italian over here and the other one you were trying to make him into your husband on a TV show. I walked on set like a queen, George adds. I was like, hi, boys, everyone doing all right? Oh, my God, I hugged Bastoni and he threw me in the air, she says. He was so nervous, I felt like the pieces were connected. We went full circle, no burnt bridges, only good memories. Um, the most amazing man and just extraordinary. Oh. Well, that's very sweet. Um, is that not how it really is? Well, that's not how I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it was. I wasn't nervous at all um, about meeting her. I knew it was coming. You Did know, you we throw were, her in the air? No, I gave her a hug. I don't believe I threw her in the air. See, don't believe everything no. you read. No, that's right. Um, I think we gave each other a hug and said hi. We hadn't seen each other in 15 years or whatever, and there's a lot of water under the bridge there. But, you know, there was no hard feelings on either. It was just weird, you know, like yeah. you sort of, I hadn't seen her for so long and suddenly you're working together. We didn't have any scenes together. So, yeah. But, um, you know, it was nice. It was sort of closure to a chapter of our lives that was, uh, you know, yeah, part of our history, I guess. And, um. There was no hard feelings or anything like that, you yeah. know. Um, but is the industry, in the Australian mm. entertainment industry is quite different in terms of the global entertainment industry because we're so far south of anything and so isolated, but so many Aussies will go off um, into the global um, industry. What are, the, what are relationships like here in Australia, do you all look after each other, or? Yeah, generally, yeah. the The industry's small. It's a it's a cottage industry here, so you know we everyone knows each other and everybody. It's like family, you know. Like you get on set and you're working with people, and it's an intense environment, and you're often sharing, you know, emotional stuff and, um, you know, discussing what your characters might be doing, and it, you know, in order to give truth to the scenes you have to go there emotionally you have to actually be invested in the work that you're doing and so you know you do get to know each other really well and and all of that stuff and generally there's a great f- sort of feeling of extended family in our in our industry here i, I didn't find that in america yeah in america it's very much you know um actors are quite selfish i found um you know very selfish and um uh, and more insecure, you know, like here we're used to not working. Yes. <laughs> so we don't, you know, we're like, oh, great, we're working. We're all happy and, you know, great to see you again and what have you been up to and, oh, I've got a family now and blah, blah, blah. Whereas in America it's like, oh, man, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna wipe you off the screen because this yeah. could be my last job, you know. Yeah. <laughs> There's that kind of attitude I found. Mm, it, yeah. it's, it's interesting also here in the Australian entertainment industry during COVID, you know, I mean, the industry was decimated, Uh However, what we saw, because, you know, people in the entertainment industry are so used to living in that gig economy that, um, you know, they were used to this hardship and used to this change that, mm. it w- you know, a lot of people weren't as significantly affected. Not saying they weren't or um, underestimating the impact, but a lot more resilient around change. 
A lot more resilient around change, but financially you're devastating for a lot of artists because most of them didn't get JobKeeper. Most of a lot of yeah. people in the arts fell through the cracks there and and really suffered financially. I don't know how they survived. Ones with families in particular, you know. I was fortunate that I got a company, um, which is Film Festivals Australia, which we run a couple of film festivals around Australia, three coming up, and. Um, so we were able to access JobKeeper, but a lot of artists weren't. And, yes. and uh, I know it was a very difficult time, but also I think a really, um, you know, it was a good time a lot for, for artists because you didn't have the option to work. So you then had to go, okay, well, it was a time for me actually to reset and go, well, who, you know, who am I? What do I want? What do I want in life? Uh, who am I? Mm. You know, what is all, you know, these questions you don't get a chance to ask when you're busy running. <laughs> That's right. When you stop running and go, okay, what's going on in my life? Mm. What would I like to change? What would I? Where do I want to go? You can actually take a breath and go. Well, mm. I've got. I can't go to. There's no job to go to, so yeah. there's no other distractions. So it's a time of, I guess, reflection. Yeah. And, which we don't do enough of. I don't think. No, no. But as you said, for some, uh, especially that a lot of people in the entertainment entertainment industry subsidise their wages through um, the hospitality industry, and that was also taken off the planet yeah. as well and yeah. Yeah. we saw a lot of you know substance misuse, misuse is something quite prevalent within the entertainment industry and yeah. you know we know that through research that's been condu conducted through entertainment assist but um do you think in fact i want to walk you back in time because back in i think it was 1987 you did record a community announcement actually it was an australian tv commercial um called uh, the drug offensive campaign <laughs> That's right, the war on drugs. Yeah. So I'm going to play this ad. I don't know how well it's going to um, convert over on the airwaves because um, I don't think technology was that su superb back then, but I'm going to give it a go if you can have a listen to this. Hang on. Are you coming or not? No. Nah. Just come out to the car then. No, I'm not into drugs. Well, you've got nothing to worry about. Good stuff. Come on, let's go. Hi. Trust me. Would I let you get into it if I didn't think you could handle it? No, I don't think so. Come on, uh, hang on. What's up? Well, he wants me to go outside. He's got some smack. Well, you're not going, are you? No, but he is cute. Sure, he's cute. But is he worth dying for? Heroin can kill, Jody. Don't get involved. Coming? No. 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 So there you go. So even though you're really cute. I wasn't worth dying you've for. Got, and your drugs were good. <laughs> My drugs were good. I wasn't worth dying for. It was funny that, that the girl who um, rejected me there was Antonia Kidman. I thought yeah. she looked familiar. Yeah, yeah. So, and the boy, the the junkie who was, uh, you know, telling me to hurry up was um, Robert Mamone. I don't know him. He's uh, played Fat Tony in the Underbelly. Series. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, funny. That was in the middle of Rocky Horror Show, and we were partying like crazy back in those days. Because it was a lot of questions around what was the music and what was the hairstyle, but that kind of makes right. sense a bit. But I guess on a serious note, um, given your experience and also how, what you advocate for as well. Mm -hmm. How far do you think we've come, not just in the industry, but, you know, more generally in how we approach uh, drugs and how we educate? Um, oh, that's a tough question. I don't think we've come very far, um, you know, because the, the narrative is still, you know, it's a war on drugs and, you know, illicit drugs are bad, um, but if you've got a headache take this or if you've got back pain take that if you've got you know so i can go to a doctor and say that i'm you know if you're not feeling right and um you know struggling with sleep or you know i hurt my knee and they'll give me valium you know um and or endone or whatever and those drugs are highly highly addictive in fact you know rehabs these days are full of people coming in with opioid addictions to things like you know Vic vicodin and oxycontin and all of those kind of things so you know, most overdoses in America are from prescription drugs. You know, all the drug, you know, all those rock stars like Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, uh, all, all the people who died, uh, Heath Ledger, they it was, you know, either um, 
like the, most of them uh, had uh, um, fentanyl in their system. And fentanyl is like a synthetic heroin, which is prescribed for pain relief. And so many people are ODing on the street because of fentanyl. Because, yeah. uh, so I don't think the war on drugs is very effective at all. I mm. think we have to sort of grow up and take the model of um, European countries and go, well, people are going to take drugs. They are going to do it. You can't stop people from doing it by making it illegal. All you're doing yeah. is creating an underground market yeah. and creating crime. Mm. So you have to then just go, okay, if you are dependent on drugs, you know, let us give you some treatment. So it has to go into more money has to go into education and treatment as opposed to fighting this war on drugs, which is ridiculous. It's never... It's, it's a slogan, it's, really. It's just ridiculous. It'll never ha work. But from your experience, having experience being a person who um, who dabbled in that space mm. and mm. have now recovered for quite a significant period of time, mm. what was it that motivated you? Um, you mentioned your son before, um, but also... What sorts of resources did you tap into or support pathways uh, did you use to enable you to, to get through it? Well, I mean, I didn't have a clue how to get through it because I didn't know anyone who didn't use drugs. You know, I didn't know anybody who didn't party and who didn't drink too much. And all the people in my phone book were people who who lived like I did pretty much, you know. So, um, and, so, you know, you'd be surprised at how many high-functioning professionals there are who have this sort of I'm double I'm not life. surprised. No. I work with them. Right, okay. So <laughs> so it's a common thing. You know, our idea of people who abuse drugs are people on the street who are washing your windscreen and, you know, looking for a fix to get some ice. That's just not the case. You know, a lot of people have these lives that they're highly, highly functioning and have, you know, high-paying jobs and powerful jobs and who have uh, substance abuse issues. And, um, the, you know, for me, it became a thing that... Um, I'd had enough. I'd had, just had enough of living. Um, I had. I was sort of. It wasn't really living. It was existing. You know, like I just sort of felt like um, a lack of hope, and uh, I didn't think. I feared for the future. I didn't feel like I'd be able to raise a family. Obviously, uh, and so um, you know, it wasn't out of control. On paper, my life looked pretty good, but I just felt dead inside, and I didn't want to go on, and I didn't want to die but I didn't want to live either and so I was caught in that thing and I didn't know anybody who <clears throat> I didn't know anybody who had gotten I knew one guy who'd gotten well who'd sort of stopped using all substances and gotten well and um, and he was really instrumental because he actually hooked me into groups of people uh, recovery groups of people who also were seeking a better life people who wanted to get off booze or drugs or gambling or whatever it was that was killing them and you know um they you know i connected with this group of people so you know i mean whatever it is that that's killing you whether it's gambling whether it's sex addiction whether it's food whether it's shopping whether it's just um, um drugs or alcohol um online gambling gaming whatever it is that's killing you <laughs> there's a group out there somewhere with a bunch of people who have stopped doing that and are now living a better life. So, you you know, all you have to do, and it's easy, to, is find out who that group of people is and tap into them. And, you know, the, my recovery journey started when I admitted that I was screwed and I admitted that I, I was all out of bullshit, I was all out of answers and I needed help. You know, because up until that point, I was really good at justifying everything and going, oh, you know, it's not so bad. It's okay. You know, like, look, I've got a nice house and I've got a nice car and I've got a great group of friends and, you know, all of this stuff, which really wasn't a good indicator of what was happening to me inside. Um, you know, so once you, well, I had no more answers and it was like, no, my life is shit and I really don't want to be here and I want to change. Once I got to that point, I was able to, admit that I needed help, and admit that I didn't have answers to get out of this. And I was pretty good at getting out of situations, you know, like, and but, but I was all out of bullshit and all out of answers. And so I needed to get new information because I didn't know how to get my way out of this hole that I dug over a period of 20 years. I didn't know how to get out of it. But I knew that there was people out there who did, who'd been through what I'd been through, who'd managed to get out of it. Um, and so I sought their help mm. and that was my the start of my recovery journey which was over 12 and a half years ago and 
how long did that take for you to sort of feel confident that you were on the other end of it? Oh, look, I started feel, feeling better in, within the first two months, you know, like I really started feeling good. I felt waking up feeling good and remembering what I thought last night and what I said last night. And it was just such a relief not having to worry about who I offended <laughs> or who I borrowed money from or who I, you know, uh, you know, insulted or whatever. It was such a relief to wake up going, oh, I know exactly where I was and what I said and what I did last night. And you probably and, didn't have to borrow money anymore. And I didn't have to borrow money anymore. And it was such a great relief. Uh, well, financial thing was just huge. But but just the feeling of um, the feeling of shame that goes with any kind of addiction is the thing that is, you know, recovery. The best thing about recovering is I'm not ashamed anymore because I spent a long part of my life being ashamed. Ashamed of who I was and ashamed of, you know, the things that I'd done. And uh, once I stopped doing that, you know, uh, my self-esteem rose and I started feeling good about myself because I was being productive. I was helping other people to try and find their way. And, um, and so it was, yeah, I mean, you know, people go, um, you know, the self-esteem, the shame and the guilt and all of that, that's what kills people with addiction. And that's why so many men, I think, take their own lives is because of shame, mm. you know, so... The way to get out of that is to first find a group of people who feel like you feel and think like you think and do what you do and go, I'm not, and that gives you the identification of a group of people who have actually gives you a bit of hope because you go, shit, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You know, there's a, this guy's done exactly what I've done, yeah. you know, and he's a bricky or he's a doctor and he's done what I've done. And, you know, like, so you start going, shit, maybe I'm not alone. And then you start sharing information and finding out what they did to stop, like, you know, I'm getting these cravings. What do I do? You know, and you get good information. You know, I'm feeling horrible. I'm this relationship with my parents or my wife or my children is, is really coming out sideways and I just don't know how to deal. And you, you talk to people and they go, well, this is what happened to me, you know, like, and this is what I did to, to help remedy that stuff. And you get information. You know, because a sick, I got to say, I had a sick mind when I came into, you know, recovery. And a sick mind can't cure itself. You know, you need new information. And so, you know, the one thing that we've lost is the tribe. You know, if you don't have a grandfather, which a lot of us don't, if you don't have older men in your life or men or people in your life who've got a bit of wisdom, who've got a bit of, uh, who've lived and can go, hey, man, you know, you're going off track here. You know, you better get back on track. If you don't have that, seek it out and get it because I needed that. I needed, in my case, it was I needed male guidance. I needed blokes who who I respected and blokes who'd learned to live a good life who could teach me how to do it mm. because I had no clue. Well, it sounds like you had not You had the opposite role models of yeah, men exactly. showing you how exactly. to. Exactly. I knew how to do all the bad stuff yeah. really well. Yeah. <laughs> but I even when I was speaking to you, was it last night? I yeah. Remember yeah. For what night it was. Yeah. Um, that I was really, you know, drawn to that conversation around the support circles that, mm. that you created and yeah. they weren't your typical ones that, you know, and again, that misinformation around just go and see your GP, just reach out to, yeah. you know, whatever large Ring charity. Or whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that this is real practical and I don't even call it advice. It's just proof points to say, if you find people in your tribe, yeah. you're most likely going to find support. Yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, like the other day, I was at this. Um, we had meetings once a week at this community house, and and uh, I noticed there was a men's shed out the back. And I, uh, through my involvement as an ambassador for uh, Are You OK Day, I, I've toured a lot of men's sheds in rural areas, and there's a wealth of wisdom in there. And there's good old blokes who are just looking, just dying for someone to walk through and go. Hey mate, show me how to bloody build a rocking horse, or you know, give you a game of ping pong or pool, or let me you know, mm. show you how to play darts. Oh, or, there's so much more to men's sheds, people yeah, than just it's a, um, it's amazing. Tools. It's, and and I walked in there and just said, "G'day, fellas," and I introduced myself to him and I said, "Do you mind if I bring my son in here one day and we can shoot some pool?" And because my son doesn't have a grandfather, so I thought, well, he needs a grandfather. Yeah, he needs an older bloke in his life that he can talk to. That's not me. Yes. Someone who he can go, you know, dad's giving me the shits or so whatever. <laughs> you know, That's right. Somebody who can and who can then go, well, son, you know, 
my father gave me the shits too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let's talk about it, you know. So it's those resources are everywhere in our communities, you know. They, they're... But unfortunately for men, though, they're not readily available. And, you know, Men's Shed Movement, which was founded here in Australia, yeah. now there's more men's sheds um, than McDonald's outlets yeah. around yeah. the world. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm a huge advocate. In fact, I, I was speaking at the Fleetwood Men's Shed um, yeah. in England yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. I reckon there was there wasn't a full set of teeth in that room, <laughs> but I would have to say it was one of the most beautiful moments of my entire life. Yeah, being with those men yeah. and the gratitude, and um, I'm also an honorary member at Monash Men's Shed down here and over the I think have been for about the last eight years and spend a lot of time down there with them and. There's so much more to sheds than just building stuff. Yeah, I was going to sure. say building shit, but we're yeah. not allowed to swear on air. Oh, okay. Whoops. Whoops. Um, yeah. But intellectual sheds. Yeah. Um, they do. We, our shed does yoga. Yeah. Now and also, you know, talking about bringing your son along. Mm. There's a push now that it's not about old retired men either. No. I mean, and those men, not disrespecting, are full of so much wealth and Amazing knowledge. Amazing stories. And, yeah. But, yeah. but knowledge and yeah. experience yeah. as well. Just because you reach an age of over 65 doesn't mean your brain goes with no, you. No, no, those guys, yeah, amazing. So hats off to um, to, to the men's shed, just absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, well, they, they wanted, this old guy said, oh, we've got a 3D printer over here. Come and show. <laughs> he goes, it's pretty incredible. You just type in whatever you want and off it goes, it prints. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a shed up in, um, I think it's Queensland, and they just restore vintage cars. Yeah. That's yeah, all, that's all they do, and they've all got incredible stories. These blokes, you know, like like you say, it's not about like even when they're building a rocking horse, yeah. right? It's not about the rocking horse. It's about the relationship that is forged during the making of that rocking horse, and how that gets put back out to the community, and how that gets as well. exactly. And yep. so, you know, like I'm actually looking at doing a documentary series at the moment called Pink Pimp My Mobility Scooter, oh. which is about partnering a young teenager with an old person and having a mutual project in this case the mobility scooter yep. that they work on and it's not really about the project it's about the relationship because how many times do you see apart from christmas a, 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 an, a, an elderly person with a teenager they yes. just don't mix they, they are like oil and water <laughs> so you know well i've got the perfect um leading man for you um ken lyons who's uh probably one of the one of the founding members here at 3wbc right I spent a lot of time on air with ken and he's he's 96 oh, okay you would not find the more agile, connected, um, fantastic. I have to get his number, and he's he's not a stranger to, to the boards either. Okay. <laughs> um, right. But speaking more about your accomplishments, uh, my research also turned up uh, when I, you know, we all know that you've had Academy Award nominations. I thought Australian Academy Award nominations. Do you, do, do you have to? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll take it. I, yes, Academy this, Award. <laughs> because you don't have to. You don't have to correct me. You. <laughs> Um, Sorry. But quite a list. It was like scrolling down. But when I was scrolling down um, these nominations and awards, the thing that kept on coming up to me was a short movie called The Widow. Oh, yeah, The Widow. And yeah. I thought, why does this keep coming up? So I watched the um, I watched the intro or whatever. What do you call it? The, the teaser. Pre yeah. Preview of that. Jeepers creepers, that goes from zero to 11 pretty fast, doesn't it? Yeah, The Widow's an incredible yeah. pe piece of work. Um, yeah, uh, Footscray filmmaker Brendan Young has, yeah. has made it, and it's uh, won over 200 awards internationally. Yeah. Daniela Farinacci, Frank Latito, and myself, and uh, a bunch of other guys uh, are in it, and it's a great story. It's actually mm. proof of concept for a much bigger project which it looks like it's going to become a series. Yeah. So uh, Brendan's oh. busily working on that. But okay. um, yeah, the, the short film itself has done very well around yeah. the world. Yeah. It looks like you might get killed in it or something. It's Well, it's a unique – it's a it's a really great genre. Mm. It's actually um, – it's it's 60s uh, Aussie gangster noir. Yeah. So it's Aussie gangster noir, which is a yeah. unique thing. Like it's mm. like we're talking about, you know, the – Back in the day, with uh, the the you know the fruit market sort of stuff, yeah, and, yeah, you know, in the sixties in in in, Austra in Australia, well, sixty five, and yeah. like, I mean I'm a massive fan of you know vintage anything, yeah, and the cars and the, the cars are amazing, really and the wardrobe's cool. great. How yeah. good does Daniela look in oh, it she's too? She's beautiful. amazing in it, just yeah. beautiful. But um, you know, just just an, another thing. I mean, you've got to you seem to do a lot in short um film, which leads me to 
um, your accompli- accomplishments with the Australian Festival. Film Festivals Australia? That's the one. Okay. I knew there was Australia in there somewhere, something had a film and it was short. Yeah. Um, but that encompasses three um, festivals. festivals. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about sure. those? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I started, uh, I moved down to the peninsula about 13 years ago, or 12 years ago, uh, Mornington Peninsula. And um, I started, there wasn't a lot of work on, so I started uh, teaching, acting. And all my students, you, all of them sort of thought, said, we want to work on film. How do we get it on a gig on television? And I was like, well, it's not easy. It's hard. And first you have to learn the skills to do that, you know. And they were saying, how do we get on a film set? And I sort of thought about it and thought, well, short film is a very accessible starting point where you can get experience on a set without actually having to get a, you know, a role in a, a TV series or feature film, which is very difficult. So let's start making some short films. And my students sort of started making shorts and then I thought, well, let's have a festival and we'll throw it open to the wider community. And the first year it was a sellout and, uh, well, sellout, it was a free event, but it was packed. The venue just got packed and nobody would seen anything like it in Rosebud in November on a rainy Saturday night. People, there's no one around anywhere, but there was a line around the block in the rain and it was incredible. And the council got behind us and we got some local businesses to sponsor us, like... Um, and we managed to, you know, put it on again next year and it doubled in size and then doubled again. And, you know, this year we celebrated our 10th anniversary and we did it at the drive-in this year because of COVID. Um, and, you know, based on the success of that, about four years ago, I decided to do a, a festival entirely powered by solar. And I started researching solar uh, power in Australia and I found that the second biggest solar farm in Australia was in Broken Hill. And Broken Hill had a very rich film industry mm. uh, and history, you know, with Mad Max and oh, Lake yeah. in Fright and Priscilla, mm. Queen of the Desert and all of that stuff. And I just thought, wow, let's do it there, you know. And it's all, Broken Hill's got this amazing sky and colours and light. And, you know, mo- many people call it the perfect light for cinema. So... Hence the name Perfect Light Film Festival. Yep. So we started that four years ago and that took off and the council's been right behind us up there. And and now we're doing a new one in Mackay, uh, an extreme sports film festival, which is, you know, those weekend warriors who put the GoPros on their mountain bikes or yeah. skateboards or kite foils or whatever and go yep. crazy. Well, they're, they're the films that we're looking for there. So, yeah. Oh, it's, fantastic. So that you've not off. had the first one yet? We haven't. No, we're doing okay. it later this year in September. So how do people get involved? Well, you you'd go to uh, our website or our Facebook page or Film Freeway. If you wanted to enter a film, you'd go to Film Freeway and you would look for extreme sports film festivals. Entries aren't open yet, yep. but they will be soon. Um, if any, if you want to make a short film these days, you know any smartphone is a studio in your pocket pretty much, so you can shoot on anything. And uh, we're not looking for technical brilliance. We're looking for great stories. And we also partner with Are You OK Day. One of the things that I like to do is have a strong feature, a strong mental health message in the, in that. So we've developed this category called the Are You OK category, which features a film with, that has a connection as a theme, connection or mental health as a theme. So, yeah, we've, um, you know, been doing that and that keeps me busy for a, a lot of the time when I'm not acting. Yeah, like how many entries would you get? On average for... Each festival varies. Like with Peninsula, we've got, you know, it's a $5,000 cash prize for first prize. So we get a lot of entries for that, over 150 and 200 a year. Because I'm sure you haven't got a huge organisation that reviews every single... No, I watch them. You you watch them. (laughs) I watch them all and then um, cut it down to like the final 30 and then we have a panel of people who, who select the finalists and judge them live on the night. Yeah. Yeah. How difficult is that to stay focused, you know, just over and over again? Because I'm sure some are better than others. Yeah, I mean, it's, I love it. I mean, I I love seeing what people come up with and it's, um, you know, I can do it in my own time. So it's no big, um, you know, chore for me. Um, Some are better than others, but, you know, you have to, you have to give them all the benefit of the doubt because sometimes, you know, a film might start off slowly and, and then just develop into something really, really good. So you always have to give them a, mm. give them a reviewing. But I think what I love about what you're doing as well is the accessibility for people to contribute to something. Yeah. Because you know 
anything that you put in film has the possibility of taking off. Absolutely. Like one of our, one of our, um, we've had really good success stories in come out of the Peninsula Film Festival. Like, well, you know, which one I want to talk about. Yeah. Well, there's Liam Kelly who's gone on to win. You know, he won an ARI award with um, Tone Tones and I Dance Monkey song. He filmed yes. that. So he's now doing all whole. You know, he's become the it boy with uh, you know music video. But then this other kid, Radea Jigasava. Uh, from Perth, who we um, gave him the emerging filmmaker one year, and he we actually uh, gave him a prize to a behind the scenes tour of Pixar Studios in in wow. uh, yeah in San Francisco. So he was too stoked, and his latest film has become uh, shortlisted for the Academy Awards. So here in Australia, no, no, the real Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to clarify that, Steve. <laughs> yeah. So you know, there's uh, it Anything can be a real possible. launching yeah. pad. Yeah. Yeah. But also when, you know, you talk about the extreme sports one with the Are You OK um, yeah. category as well, I think, you know, not that I'm generalising at all, but extreme sports typically are more attractive for, for men. Yeah. And I think that, you know, these kinds of activities, even though I, the thought of my sons doing extreme sports scares me, but, you know, it's just another occupation that they can get involved in that is um, relatively healthy and um you know, keep, keeps us safe. Yeah, trying to keep a helmet on their head is uh, always oh. a challenge. Like my son thinks, you know, he can skateboard and ride a BMX with no helmet. And I'm like, dude, put the helmet <laughs> on, you know. Well, my oldest son, he's 23, he's the chef. He's like six foot three. And he has decided to do some self-care, you know, working very long hours. So he started skateboarding yeah. without, in, like, no in protection. shorts. He goes, oh, mom, have a look at this. Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. no, please don't show me. Ah, oh, skateboarding, Because when yeah. he falls, it's like six foot three. Yeah, it's a slab of beef hitting the pavement. <laughs> it's not, yeah. When you're little, you just bounce back up. Yeah, that's right. I, I ride an electric skateboard and it, it goes very fast. And I've had a couple of bad stacks on it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, good luck with the festivals because, um, yeah. again, I think that your industry is very um, under underrated in terms of how much work goes in and how much stuff happens that, you know, we just look at blockbusters or we just look at what's popular or what's on Netflix. And I think even Netflix and other streaming services as well, consumers are just so greedy in how we consume, not thinking about the work and the art and the the time that goes into production, we just expect more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without and any Netflix, gratitude. Yeah, well, that's true. And um, it is a, such a big part. Like when we look at, you know, that COVID was a great example. It was so ironic that, you know, there was so much funding, so much funding was cut from the arts in a period of a few years. Yet when COVID hit, what did we all turn to? You know, we, we all just went, you know. Uh, how ironic, yes. Yeah, music or film or television got yep. us through, you know. Yep. So because, yeah, so it is important. Um, it is, uh, you know, art is, a, it does point the mirror back at us. All those cliches, it's true. You know, it does give us a sense of community, a sense of place and opportunity to look at ourselves and 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 understand ourselves, you know, through through art, you know. Mm. And, and it connects us somehow too, you know, like you know, there's something beautiful about the communal experience of an audience all experiencing the same thing at the same time, you know, whether it be comedy or horror or whatever. When, when there's a collective gasp in the audience, everyone feels it. Or when, when somebody next to you has got a funny laugh and they're just rolling with laughter, it's infectious and you catch it and the guy next to you catches it and so on and so forth. And it's a communal experience that that binge watching TV at home doesn't have. No. Yeah, no, so not at all. Theater and film, yeah, theater and and cinema, you know, does have that collective experience, which is why I love doing the the film festivals. Yes, and and what you produce as well, because we were talking about one of the um, award winning short films that you produced as part of the potential film film. film <laughs> I can't even speak. I <laughs> ran out of words. Blah blah blah. Um, the gift. Yeah, the gift. Yeah, and I'd not. I watched it. I was going to say, heard. I've not. I had not watched it before, and I watched it the other night, and I was really, really moved by. It and we we spoke about it. Um, mm. But it's it's a movie or, or a short film. Yeah. Um, about connecting. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. um, and you described to me how you edited it and then made it into the bit that captured me. And it's, yeah. Do, do you want to tell you tell the audience? Yeah. Well, we sort of. I had this idea because I was standing in a, a queue at a supermarket, and I saw this young mum come 
to, um, you know, it was a bit of a queue at the supermarket and there was a young mum who was struggling with a baby and under one arm and trying to pay for her things and she didn't have enough money for some of the items. And there was about six of us in the line and we were all kind of a bit impatient going, oh, come on, what's the bloody hold up? But she had this moment where she had to actually put something back and it was really awkward and weird and everybody in the line felt just what's going you know this is really cringy and making me feel very uncomfortable and not one of us thought oh why don't i just buy it for her and just go hey you know what you don't have to put back that butter here here's five bucks you know and later i went away and thought why didn't i do that you know and so i created this short film around that idea um that a guy was going to sort of um take his own life and right during the writing of his note he runs out of ink and um and goes to the supermarket to to get a, a new pen <laughs> so he can continue to write this note and um and during the course of that experience he meets this young woman and he has this incredible incredibly intense sort of um, uh, meeting i guess that changes his whole you know gives him a reason to live you know, and it sounds cliched, but it's actually quite a moving little scene. And um, yeah, it, we, when we cut it together, it didn't quite work. And so uh, the editor just mucking around switched it to black and white. And I said, wow, black and white, it just ch changed everything. And I said, we need to slow down that moment because it was one moment that was an exchange between the two. And it was just something that happened in their eyes that was missed. It was just went too quickly. So I said, can we just slow that right down? and just cut out all the music and drop out everything and just have this sort of moment of stillness where time just stops and and it was and that was what changed the whole film and made it a mm. moment that you sort of went oh okay that was a life changing moment for yeah. that guy you know yeah. and and it was just in the editing that we made that moment possible because we didn't I failed as a director to capture it on the day so we <laughs> managed to do it in the mm. editing suite which that film went on to win a lot of awards internationally. But the proudest bit about it for me was that it was played in New South Wales Parliament as part of Mental Health Week. Um, and the um, Mental Health Australia uh, commissioned it. And um, it's had an impact. It's still being played in schools in Canada today. So. And so it should be. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's online too. You can actually go and watch it at... If you <coughs> log on to Vimeo, uh, Peninsula Film Festival, The Gift. You don't even have to do that. You can just oh. type in The Gift, oh. Steve Bastoni, oh, and it'll go. just come up. That's all I did. <laughs> Good on you. Um, I've always, I can never find it. I went to show people. I'm like typing yeah, all the I'll wrong worry, stuff. I've also put a link on my Facebook as oh, well. Oh, cool. So awesome. um, anyone just can access me on Facebook, Ray Bonnie, and uh, you'll find that. But I think when you talk about it, using it as curriculum, you know, it's part of my role is is to you know, do a lot of this kind of presenting in workplace, and you know it's it's so difficult to get the message across to people that this is not rocket science. Yeah, you know, kindness and care and one gesture. Yeah, one act of kindness. Absolutely. It doesn't, and that act of kindness could be a smile. Yeah, you know, and I think that's what the gift really drives home is yeah. this one gesture. It is. It's like that butterfly effect, you know. It's yep. like just a tiny little thing can have massive ramifications. Yep. You know, and, and, and you will never know. Yeah. You, you don't have to know. We don't have to know the impact that yeah. we have on others. But you can be damn sure that a little bit of kindness and care yeah. can be the very thing that um, stops a person from turning left rather than right. Yeah. And, you know, you just got no idea of the effect that we have on people through not returning calls, yeah. Um, just being dismissive of people yeah. or just think, oh, let's be rude to somebody. Just just don't. Yeah, well, yeah, don't be an asshole. Yeah. Um, but How much <laughs> swearing sorry, on this show? I'm play, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I find it really easy to be kind to strangers and everything, but it's at home that I find the biggest challenges. Like to practice my patience and tolerance and kindness and all those wonderful spiritual principles that I value so highly, to practice that at home with my children or my wife and people who I'm so familiar with and are part of my everyday existence, that's the opportunity for, for me, you know, to learn to become a better dad and a better husband. And, you know, because 
could see I'm too busy to listen to my kids and, you know, I'm too busy to get down on the floor and play Lego. My wife's talking to me and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm busy. I've got to go to, you know, why can't I extend that kindness and, and respect to the people I love the most, you know? So it's, it's, that's why I always find the measure of how I'm traveling is and what I'm like at home. Mm. <clears throat> but you're right. I mean, but I think they get the busy thing as well. Like why asking yourself the question? Cause I'm, I'm the same, you know, my seven days a week is usually quite full up and yeah. it's 24 hours a day. Yeah. However, when anyone ever asks me, oh, you must be so busy. I go, I'm not busy at all. I just have a lot of interesting things I'm doing. Yeah. And the other day, in fact, I was, um, I was presenting back to back on online because we're still doing that because of COVID. And between um, sessions, I had two hours. So I thought I'm taking the dog to the park. I've just got to get amongst nature yeah so i've taken v dogs to the park and it's got a big lake and walking along and i met a lady and uh we well, she was f fussing over my dog because he's cute and somehow that sign on my head was still there to say talk to me about anything you like <laughs> yeah. so she started you know spilling her life about yeah. her relationships and me being me it's like it's amazing very that happens. Yeah. very very present and sure. then i've looked at my watch and gone shit i've got to be back like at one o'clock i'm going i really have to go but she latched on and I said, you need to let me go. So we left off. Okay. So I'm running up the hill because there's no quick way out of this park. And then this group of women stopped me and said, oh, could you please take a photo of us? And I've gone, <laughs> sure, I can do that. Of course I can. Uh, I'm going, oh my God, please hurry. And they go, now can we have one with your dog? And I'm going, yeah, oh, okay. God. So I, um, lucky I'm reasonably fit and I got out of there and I got back with five minutes to spare. What I'm, what I'm not saying is how great am I. I'm saying more that sometimes you are not too busy. Yeah. You know, we race through life and go too busy, too busy. Mm. But sometimes when you just take that moment and breathe yeah. and stay in that moment yeah. to go, it will just work out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You go, you know, a little bit of oxytocin is, you know, activated in yeah. you and you, you feel a sense of, of well-being as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And we do, we spend, you know our life rushing, lurching from one emergency to the next. And it was such a revelation to me when somebody said to me, Steve, slow down, mate. When you die, your inbox will not be empty, right? <laughs> you just need you'll to be chill. In, you'll be in the yeah, box. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can just relax. And how imp things like how important is it? You know, how important is it? You know, is it worth getting into a tease over, you know? Exactly. Is it, is it important like today, um, you know, no transmission? Yeah, yeah. Um, Speaking of which, I know that we have to jump off air because coming up next, we um, have the footy. Yeah. Our award-winning VFL football broadcast is coming up next. And I think this is our first time back uh, since uh, August 2019. So getting okay. online will be um, our president here, Phil Edwards, who does a smashing job with our the commentary and Brad Mullen and Peter Lorsch and Fletcher Fraser will be down there at Box Hill Hawks Fantastic. having a bit of a crack on air. And, mm. uh, but I did just want to remind people that if anything that we've spoken about today has brought up any uncomfortable feelings uh, or triggered anything for anyone, please uh, get help. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Steve. What's the number for Lifeline? Oh, 13, 11... 14? Is yes. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Hey, there, there you go. You, you go. are an ambassador. All right. Uh, suicide callback service is 1300 659 467. And of course, emergency services is is triple zero. So um, almost 100 Ks back uh, to the peninsula, Steve. Not going back. Going to go and watch some basketball. Oh, no, with your surfboard. Yeah, I'm bringing while well, I'm going to the Gold Coast tomorrow. So I'm going to stay in town tonight. Going to basketball tonight, then I'm going up to the Gold Coast to surf, do some meditation, and sun my cheeks. <laughs> 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 because sometimes you just got to go, you deserve a holiday, mate. Good on you. Nobody ever does that. Nobody ever goes to you, why don't you take a week off? You've been. To... So that's one of the self care things I've taught myself is to go, yeah. when I'm feeling run down, take it. Yes, because then you're more likely then to you're recharge. Better. Well, yeah, you're yep. better off. Mm. Yeah. Now, how would you rate your time at 3WBC, say, compared to um, like being on set at Matrix, at the Matrix? Oh, this is much more exciting. 
<laughs> this is much more. They had better food on Matrix, but you know, this is cool. This is like flying by the seat of your pants. This is real. A bit it's more, great. It? Yeah. No, it's good. I love it. I love talking about stuff that's real. Now another yeah. thing, because you, you um, were in the naughty books, is that we did um, create a bit of a song list for you. Oh yeah. But um, because I yeah, bored the audience up with about your seven minute songs. <laughs> with my seven minute songs, we didn't play any any, but um, but next time you come on, yeah, um, sounds good. We can save those because I'm sure that there's a lot more to um, to talk about. Sure. So um, we've got what do we have? We've got. Two more minutes to go, and mm. in that time, I want to thank you. Thank you for for driving all the way because originally, uh, you suggested that we might do this over the phone, which which we can do. But once we got talking, I said, "This is too important." Yeah, this is a face to face. This has got to be yeah. live. We've got to see this. So hopefully, everybody has enjoyed. Please contact me on Facebook or Ray at RayBonnie dot com. Uh, you can send me an email if you have any questions, and I can pass them on to Steve as well. And now I have to do something really um, quite difficult and that is swap between us and the footy. So I'm going to do that right now, Steve. So um, I'll just watch in amazement. Just watch um, in amazement as I do this and then run to Studio 2 to switch the footy on, right? Okay. Hey, see you later, everyone. See ya. I'll be back next month. Remember.